everybody. Wanted to welcome you to part one of two of a special Halloween month bonus episode with Pat Jankowitz. He is the walking human IMDb, and we talk all things horror movie related and some other bonus tidbits done in there, too. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to another episode of The Unseen Paranormal, where some of the scariest things are unseen. I'm your host, Eric Freeman. All right. Today, we have a special Halloween bonus show for you. We are going to be talking to Pat Jankowitz. Pat is an author, a writer for numerous publications around the world, including Fangoria Magazine, and he is a beloved thespian of the stage and screen. We're going to be talking <laughs> fun facts and behind the scenes of some of your favorite horror movies and about some you may have never heard of before. Hey, Pat, how are you doing today? Not bad, Eric. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I was glad that uh, that Steve connected us and uh, and I could get you on, especially to, you know, Halloween's coming up and and uh, do these little bonus episodes talking about, you know, horror movies, and it kind of fits all into paranormal stuff. I've never met a bad person through Steve Joyner, so you have a lot to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy, and I'm, I'm very thankful for him. So let's talk a little bit about your background and how you got started. You got started off as an interviewer, really, really young, of interviewing people about movies and television and stuff. That's true. I mean, it was one of the things when I came to California. I came to California as a teenager, and when I got here, Everybody was talking about their movies in the industry like it was a thousand miles away. Well, I come from Michigan, which it was three thousand miles away. So when I was running for my school paper, I just started crashing movie sets, you know. And uh, my brother Donald had figured out, you know, this is the days before the internet, you know. What I mean? My brother Don figured out that every movie needed a shooting permit, and when he found out. Rare and variety, like of shooting permits, he would go through it and pick the movies that sounded good, anything with monsters or robots or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, because we were so young, we had to find someone with a driver's license who could get us to the set and back. And, you know, preferably kids whose parents would freak out if they were with us on a set until like five or six in the morning. Yeah, and you and you got a good start with, with um, some famous people right off the bat. You kind of got some access to talk to them and and do some good interviews. Well, my, my three big interviews for my school paper were uh, Ray Bradbury, Mick Garris, and, um, and Jerome Bixby, who wrote for the Twilight Zone and Star Trek and a bunch of other stuff, you know. And I mean, in California, in California, everyone is local, you know. I mean, it, the chances of a good interview are more local than they would be if I were in Michigan doing phoners, you know what I mean? Right, right. When I started doing professional interviews, when I, when I, I sold to the British film market, which is still, I, I think, uh, the British market has the best layouts. I mean, they're, they're the flashiest layouts compared to American ones. You know what I mean? If you go to, if you go to the newsstand and you, uh, newsstand, that's only my great grandfather. <laughs> if you go to Barnes and Noble and look at, uh, and look at American magazines versus British ones, the British always have a better eye for color. And splash your layouts, which is what I appreciate. Yeah, yeah. And some I looked up some of your magazine covers that some of the articles that you've done in some of the magazines and it's kind of that same way. Like it really catches your eye because it's a little busy, but at the same time not too busy. It's bright colors and and a lot of pictures and, and a lot of text and it just kinda of catches your attention. Exactly. I mean if you're gonna knock yourself on an article, you want a layout guy to knock it you're right, the splashy with color and busy, maybe a little busy. But at the same time, if I'm going to write an article in the middle of the night, I want somebody to read it. I mean, nobody does anything they don't want anyone to see. You know what I mean? I mean, right. uh, um, so if you're going to knock yourself out in an article or, or something, you just want the layout guy to appreciate that enough to make it look commercial, you know? Yeah. When you do a podcast, you want to do the most interesting one possible. You want to ask the best questions, and you want to make sure you have the best sound. It's the same thing. You want the product to be as shiny and, and interesting looking as possible, you know? Right. Steve introduced me to you as a walking IMDb. And uh, <laughs> so that's why I want to have it's you on. Pathetically sad superpower, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about, about some of the horror movies. Um, when I think horror movies and that type of genre, horror suspense, I grew up 80s, 90s, so I automatically go to like the slasher movies. Those are kind of some of my favorites. But you wrote a um, companion to Jaws. 
uh, to the Jaws movie. And uh, that is that is a quintessential horror movie if you really think about it because you have that protagonist that is kind of, you know, offing people. So how did you get into writing that companion to Jaws and, and meeting all those people? And as a kid, I saw it at the drive-in on its, like, third or fourth movie release, you know, years after it came out, but it never ran on television at the time, and it just terrified me. It was the scariest movie I'd ever seen as a kid. I mean, you got to remember, I, I, I had no access to all any movies or anything, you know, except everything based up on TV. So seeing Jaws at the drive-in and, and watching my brothers and sister and, Everybody just jump in the middle of the Dodge van. You know what I mean? I mean it, it had an effect. You know, your first monster or horror movie on the big screen always does. You know, and yeah, and and seeing the driving screen and and you know, it always remained one of my favorite movies, and it's always been one of the fifteen to twenty most often run movies on basic cable. Yeah, and, and that changes over the years. But you can tell the ones that bring in the big ratings for TBS and then TNT and everything. And Jaws has always been one of them. No matter what the other ones are, it'll be Tom Gunn, it'll be this, it'll be Jurassic Park. Jaws has always remained one of them. And Jaws would get, Jaws basically owns its own holiday. On the 4th of July weekend, you know, AMC will run an all-day marathon of Independence Day Another channel will run uh, uh, all day Rocky Marathon because Jaws and Rocky, the 4th of July is at a crucial date in Jaws and Rocky. Both movies are centered around the 4th of July. Right. So to run a marathon of Jaws and Rocky movies on the 4th of July is actually a really smart marketing idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Jaws ran and ran and ran and running for these different magazines if somebody had been tangentially connected to Jaws or one of its sequels, I, I would always mark off part of my time to talk to them about that. I did a big story on Roy Arbogast. Um, you know, he did Christine. He did John Carpenter's The Thing. He did Return of the Jedi. He did the uh, John Bantam Dracula. I mean, anytime you had a mechanical effect, you would bring in Roy Arbogast for decades. And, and Roy... Roy was the guy who got the shark running. You know, he was Bob Maddie's protege. And it was his job to help Maddie by keeping the shark going in all the Jaws movies. And, and, the, and the shark was notoriously wrought with problems from the get-go. And by the way, Roy will bring this up as a point of pride, you know, because uh, over the years, everyone has kicked the hell out of the shark. You know, uh, Spielberg and everyone else. But as Roy will tell you, he told them at the time, and Bob Maddie told you, know, nobody thought a giant animatronic shark would work. Roy Albagast and Bob Maddie were the guys, you know, with Joe Alves. And none, none of the studios, none of the studios thought it could work, it could be sustained. And when they built the shark, when they built the shark, they'd only tested him in, uh, they'd only tested him in fresh water. The shark worked in the tank. The shark worked in, in fresh water. But when they took him to Universal, when, when Universal threw all, threw all the molds on a, on a giant truck and took them to Martha's Vineyard, the salt water would corrode the shark. He said basically it was trial by fire, you know? He goes, any of the movie would have shot him in a tank or shot him in a lake. But because Spielberg wanted to shoot in the actual ocean, they said it, it, the corrosive effects of the ocean when you look at the shark, he works perfectly in every shot they use in the movie. And it may have taken them a hundred shots to get to it. But he, to me, he's the big cry of the animatronic. Spiller got the idea to go to Bob Maddie because he was loved, loved, loved the squid in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which, which Maddie had also built. And when you look at the shark in Jaws, there's nothing like him. You know, there, there's nothing like him. There's never been an effect like that in a movie. That the entire movie, the entire climax depends on that shark showing up and being as scary and good as it is. So Bob Maddy, uh, so Roy Obergast with the point of pride would talk about how, uh, how, you know, they made it work, you know, they made, so, so I kept hearing these Jaws stories and this is years after Carl Gallagher's amazing book, The Jaws Log. And I just kept putting, filing away these Jaws stories thinking this would be good material for a book. Because you'd hear stuff you'd never heard before in any other movie. I mean, 
the fact that they're trapped on this island until they get the, the, the shark to work, that's a really compelling story for a book. So when I was, when I was working on my normal articles for these different film magazines, I finally had enough sharks, I had enough jaw stories that I started seeking out cast members, you know? I grabbed everybody I could reach in California. I went to Joe Alves' house, the production designer, who also designed the shark, designed every shot of the movie, and he directed Jaws 3D. When I went to his house and I looked at all his charcoal drawings for the movie, before the movie was made, I finally decided there's a book in this. When Joe Alves was telling me stories I'd never heard before, I just realized that after Joe Alves, I got Susan Bakuni, who was the first victim. And at the time, you know, just out of college, I was thinking of, you know, filing these articles away. I chased Carl Gottlieb until I got an interview with him. I, I did an interview with him for something else. Carl was originally, before Marvel movies were common, at one point, Carl was going to write a She-Hulk movie. So that was my article was on the She-Hulk movie. All the different attempts to make a She-Hulk movie for an old magazine called Comic Scene. You know, and uh, Comic Scene had a small but dev- dev- devoted following. So it became a system for me where I could literally go to this magazine and pretty much run whatever I wanted. I would find guys like David Goyer who weren't getting that much attention and you could do a cover story on them. Because every comic article was covering the same crap. You know, they were covering the same comics which weren't selling. So by doing comics and movie stuff, the sales, the, their sales would spike. So I became the, this, this comic to movie guy. And I would basically use... Com- comic scene has probably been the most important magazine I wrote for because my stories would spike sales. You know, and, and when I would pick something that nobody else was covering... They would all do every comic magazine, Wizard included, who I also wrote for at the end. They would do the same five comic articles. And once you come in and you do comic related movie articles, it would freak people out. It was, it was a different approach, you know? Right. And, and so the editor doesn't know any better. He would bury your stuff in the back and then, you know, oh, it's movie related. I, I want to do comic articles. And then they would get complaints that, why did you bury the best article in the issue? You know, you know what I mean? I mean <laughs> so you take something like that with low circulation, and they, they get a modest spike out of something you pitched and brought to them. It got easier and easier to do stuff for them, because everybody was doing the same five articles. You know, uh, Image, Dark Horse, Marvel, DC, just easily rotting comic stuff, and no one was buying the comics. But if you combine comics with movies, you suddenly had a fresh take on everything, you know? Yeah. And so that, that rolled you into networking and, and knowing all these people to, to do a Jaws companion book. Exactly. Exactly. So I had enough, I had enough uh, Jaws articles, and I had enough stories from these guys. I literally turned around. I literally turned around and started pitching the, uh, the thing. And there was a big pushback on Jaws originally. This really bothered me. People held the sequels against the movie. You don't see people judging Godfather by Godfather 3. You don't see people judging The Exorcist by Exorcist 2, The Heretic. But people resented Jaws because they hated Jaws 2 or Jaws The Revenge. I, I've never seen that before. And I, I was kept getting rejected by people saying to me, uh, why would you want to cover all of them? The first one's the only good one. That's what they were literally write, you know, in the rejection letter. And to me, it became a point of pride. I want to cover it because every one of those movies is canon. Every one of those movies has a member of the Brody family, no matter how preposterous. It's the, it's the, it's canon. Alex Kinder's mother is in Jaws the Revenge. That's canon. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. so I pushed. I tried to do everything on the original sh- on the original Jaws. I could. Stuff that had never been heard or seen before. And Roy Armagast's place really had a porcelain toilet type material. And of that, he had like this six foot thing of the original shark. This porcelain shark with a marble eye is what sold Universal on making the movie. So Roy pulled this out and it, it got broken in a minor earthquake. And Roy threw it out. So when you look at my book, that's the only single picture you will see of that tabletop model. 
Well, and Carl Jolly writes about how important that model was in Jaws in, in the Jaws log, but there are no pictures of that in the book. None of the Jaws documentaries have it in there either, because when I did my book, I took the physical pictures, and then when it was smashed and thrown away, well, by the time they got their cameras in there, nobody had anything to show. Wow, that's pretty And cool. with the Jaws book, when when it was coming out, you know, when it was about to pitch it, they did a they did a Jaws fest, the first official Jaws fest in Malta's Vineyard in the in the mid the early two thousands. And my brother kept saying to me, "You ought to go to this. You ought to go to this." And I said, "No, no, no. There's no reason to go to that." And then. Within four days of the event, they added like three guests I couldn't say no to. And he, he said to me, you got to get down there. And the tickets were over a thousand bucks at that point, you know, for the summer. Yeah. So, yeah, so we got a driveway, like in the hitcher on the vanishing point, And we drove across country. At the very last minute, we drove across the entire continental United States. We drove from California to Martha, to, uh, to, to Jersey and to, to Chicago. We did the last 400 miles in a satellite truck. We get to Martha's Vineyard and, and of course you can't bring a car to Martha's Vineyard. We are, we're on the island. The only thing I could afford, cause I didn't take the trip seriously. I didn't think I was really going to do it. And when I got to the island, all the hotels were booked up. So I stayed at the campground. You know, we, we camped in the campground in the middle of skunk season. <laughs> and I got, I got everybody. I got everybody. I have every single victim of the original shark, except Robert Shaw and the dog, because they were both dead. I got Mrs. Kittner. I went to the dog's grave. My brother points out we went to the dog's grave when, um, and then there was a typo in my book where they called the they, they called the dog Tippet instead of Pippet, so everyone bust my chops for that. <laughs> <laughs> once you do a book like that, once you get everybody talking. Once you get pictures of everything, the, the great thing about the museum was the museum had, the, there was a museum on the island and all the locals came. So you would get stories you'd never hear anywhere else. The town school teacher told this amazing story about how uh, Kathy Weiss, how Steven Spielberg offered her a hundred dollars to drop her three year old daughter in water over her head, screaming shark, 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 shark. And she walked over and bitched him out. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you say that to me? How dare you say that to me as a mother? Blah, blah, blah. So she ran the riot act, which is pretty funny. I've never heard that story before or since. You know, and, and when you were on the island, I met this hard bitten homicide detective from Boston, and he's the kid with the fake friend. He made me do it, you know, with his big brother who terrorizes the beach. Yeah. I got him. I got. I mean, to me, Jaws is one of those movies. You know, I know like, you'll you, you feel this way about your most beloved slasher movie. Even the, even the U5s, even the minorest role is now a classic beloved character. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So to get the kid with the fake fin, to get, to get the guy playing the guitar on the beach at the opening, to get the first victim, to get all these characters, to get Mrs. Kintner, Kintner who just passed away, the, the great Lee Fiero, to get all these people, it was just a cultural thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, and to get people like that, you're probably going to get some better stories from behind the scenes than, like, Steven Spielberg. You talk to him. You know, he's done so many iconic movies. You know, he's not going to give you, like, nitty-gritty stuff that you really want to hear, like, the the more most interesting parts of that. And also, he's done so many interviews on, you know, those type of movies, like Jaws and his other movies. So you're not going to get those, those good stories, the meat of what actually happened behind the scenes and stuff. Honestly, the biggest meat and potato story from Spielberg about my book came from James Fagan Cameron. I interviewed James Cameron. You know, we did a big thing. Uh, I did a big interview with James Cameron. And then the opportunity had presented itself where two weeks after the interview, Cameron had a good time in the interview and his person called and said, Jim wants to know if you want to cover this event at Caltech. And when I, when I interviewed uh, Cameron the original time, I gave him a copy of the Jaws book. You know, and I and it was kind of exciting because I watched him. He handed the book to his daughter, and then I saw him before he pulled out. He kept flipping through the book, so I felt really good about that. The Jaws book, yeah. And so he told me he read the book in bed. He goes, "It's a fast read, a good read." But he told me he went to the Beverly Hills Hotel for a meeting for a project with Steven Spielberg, 
And he said to Spielberg, I've got something to show you. And he handed him a copy of my book. So the greatest moment of my life between Spielberg and Cameron, I wasn't there for, but I got the description from James Cameron, so I felt pretty honored. Right. He said Spielberg took my book when Cameron excitedly handed it to him, and he said he started flipping through the book, and then he dropped it like a hot potato on the table. And he goes, that movie tried to kill me. And Spielberg, Cameron goes, how can you hate the movie that gave you everything possible in your life? <laughs> And he looked at him again, and he repeated, that movie tried to kill me. And he said, <laughs> he said he'd never seen someone with PTSD over the movie that had them everything. So when you see Spielberg, and he opens up about like two or three Ken stories on Jaws, hearing the stories from a guy like Cameron about how he's genuinely traumatized by the experience, right. you know? Right. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And he, he, was, he was traumatized. He said, he said, looking at your book, looking at the pictures of the shirt in the book was enough to bring it all back to him. And he literally told, uh, he literally told Cameron he resented the movie for what it did. <laughs> <laughs> it's tortured him all these years. <laughs> it tortured him all these years. It made more money than any movie in history up to that point. It ain't the Godfather, the Exorcist, the Sound of Music. And yet he was so traumatized by the experience he couldn't accept it. <laughs> What are, what are some of your favorite stories that you put in the book that you heard from, from various cast and crew? Well, the, the school teacher one I love because she, she got as impassioned as she was in, in the, the time that she in the movie when she was telling us the story. You could, you could see her eyes knit with anger just thinking about it. Uh, other stories, just hitting the island holding Ben Garner's Oh, here's a great story. I held Ben Garner's head. And I do a lot of creatures in movies, and, and I do a lot of stuff for the Bermans, the Berman family. You know, Rob Berman, who does a lot of special effects in different movies. His father, Tom Berman, who's this multiple Emmy winner, did the Phantom of the Paradise mask and teeth, did the teeth for Jaws and James Bond, did all the pod people invasion of the body snatchers. Guy's got an amazing uh, devil's reign, won a ton of Emmys for Nip Tuck. You know, he's done everything. The guy's done everything. You know, Captain Yo and all this other stuff he was involved with. Well, he, he, it turned out, he told me this later. He goes, when he, he saw the book and he goes, I, and then Rob told me, he goes, Pat, you know, dad cast, uh, Ben Gardner's head and, and the severed limbs you see in the movie, right? And I had no idea. I had no idea that Tom Berman had done all that. But I'm uh, stories in the book. One of my favorites is Jaws 2. There's a scene where Brody gets drunk and gets fired. Gets fired and gets drunk. And, and Deputy Hendricks comes over, and Deputy Hendricks and his wife, and Brody's wife are trying to cheer him up. And, and Chief Brody and his, his wife keep thanking Hendricks for coming over. You know, and they, they uh, and they keep, they keep thanking, uh, they keep for coming over. And they keep calling the actor by his real name. <laughs> the character, the, the character's name is Lenny Hendricks. He's yeah. in the first movie even. And then the second one in Jaws 2, in the scene, they keep calling him Jeff and Jeffrey, Jeff and Jeffrey, which is the actor's real name. So you have this massive movie that was shot in such a hurry, nobody noticed they were using the actor's real name. <laughs> That's crazy to think that, yeah, with those big productions, you can still have stuff like that that, that just kind of gets you Isn't that weird? I mean, yeah. it's like uh, uh, another great story. It's Jaws 3D is five miles inland, so the shark couldn't break into SeaWorld if he tried. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the Leia Thompson, it was Leia Thompson's first movie, and uh, and just all the stuff. Uh, uh, the, the guy, John Putch, who became a film director, he said Leia Thompson was so green you know, because uh, it, it, it was the first thing she did. She, it was before All the Right Moves, and after she did a Burger King commercial. And then she was discovered for Jaws 2, because everyone fell in love, I mean, Jaws 3D, because everyone fell in love with her from this Burger King commercial, you know, where she looks at the camera and says, special orders don't upset us, you know. So they hire her for the movie, and John Putch realizes that this is going to be his on-screen girlfriend. So he tells Leia Thompson, he goes, you know, because our characters are in love, we have to convince the camera we're in love, so we, we need a French kiss for real. And he said, 
he said he's French kissing her in every scene. And then she started having an affair with uh, Dennis Quaid. And he goes, and Dennis came in to watch a scene. He could have stopped it that right quick. <laughs> 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 so, uh, uh, knowing that, another great story, Lance, Lance Guest from uh, Halloween 2 and The Last Starfighter, Lance Guest said they were shooting the footage, the, the, there's a different version of Jaws and Events that runs on TV, where, where uh, uh, Melvin Van Peebles, his, his son Mario, is eaten by the shark but lives, which they shot two weeks after the movie bombed domestically, to get away <laughs> We decided it must be because they killed Mario Van Peebles. So before we send it overseas, we need to have Mario Van Peebles live. So they shot the scene where he lived literally a week or two after the movie bombed in American theater. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it you comes know, down they, to they the shot a lot of that. Also, a lot of that was shot. In, if you want to see Jaws, when you see Jaws the Revenge, the big finish with the shark, you see water slapping against the horizon. That was all shot in the Truman Show tank at Universal Studios. So they already had the walls painted like like the sky scene and all that stuff. Exactly, exactly. So they shot it. The, the Jaws of Revenge tank is where they shoot the sailboat ending of Truman Show. So, but it's amazing. It fools you in Truman Show until they don't want it to. In Jaws of Revenge, they're just in such a hurry. You literally see the water slapping against the wall of the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you were part of a uh, documentary that just came out on Amazon Prime for everybody to watch that has Amazon Prime called 50 best horror movies you've never seen. And uh, I had the pleasure of watching it the other night, and you're one of the one of the commentators on there talking about the movies. What are some of your best movies from that list that people should go out and see? Well, by the way, the, the great thing about that is that was Anthony, documentary filmmaker Anthony Massey brought me in for that. And the great thing about that is he brought me, uh, um, there was one movie I insisted on, Human Rights in the Deep, because it was one of those movies that you, if you found it on cable as a kid while spending the summer at your grandma's house, it made a lasting impression because it's got the best monsters, the weirdest, most depraved things happen in the movie, but it's also a classic horror movie. It's like it's like, it's like uh, Roger Corman's Piranha where they take a 50s new horror movie idea and turbocharge it with modern gone sex, you know? So Human Aids would be, well, Human Aids would be on my list. Trilogy of Terror, isn't it? You know, the TV, the famous TV movie Richard Matheson and William F. Nolan wrote, where Matheson introduces the, the Zuni fetish doll, which basically they ripped off for Chucky and everything else. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. And I mean, stop motion, puppetry. The voice of the puppet was the voice of, uh, of Tony the Tiger. So that's in there. That totally belongs in the list. I think Basket Case deserves more attention than it's ever gotten. Basket Case is a weirdly great movie, and you can tell it's a great movie because it was ripped off for an art house movie called Twins Idaho, which is basically Basket Case without the mutant brother. Twin Falls, my brother cracks me from the other room. Um, so that, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, that one, I mean, Bas- I gotta ask you, what were your favorites? Um, Basket Case is one of them. Um, that was one that I recognized from the list. Um, which is just a, it's a weird premise with, with him having his, spoiler alert, with his Siamese twin cut off and he carries around a basket. But, yeah, uh, yeah, fantastic, isn't it? And, and they, they made it for no money. And I think, uh, I want to say uh, Kevin Yeager, or either Kevin Yeager or, or uh, oh gosh, um, Caglione, John Caglione. I believe that was Caglione and his partner did that, but for no money at all. And you watch the movie, and it has no right to be as good as it is. You know, the sound is occasionally muffled and stuff, and yet the movie is so strong, and Frank Henwater is such a great writer-director that you stay with it the entire time, you know? And uh, one of the things I didn't know, um, like everybody kind of defines the slasher movies by the original Halloween, but there was a movie before that that kind of Halloween ripped off a little bit, and it kind of inspired all of the rest of the slasher movies. By Christmas. Yo, oh, you've never seen Black Christmas? I have not. And I didn't know that it was, I, I thought, because uh, the original Halloween movie, uh, John Carpenter's Halloween is one of my favorite, if not my favorite uh, horror movie. And so I thought, you know, that was kind of the dawn of the of the slasher movie. And I was surprised to, to see that, no, that, you know, this other lesser known movie was actually the archetype for that. Yeah, they took the, the, the point of, John Carpenter took the point of view camera and the breathing 
But I would argue Carpenter does a much better. There's something I, I'll be honest. There's something nihilistic and dark and depressing about about Black Christmas. And I mean, the director later did the amazing Christmas story. So you know, he did something very life affirming. I my as much as I love Black Christmas, and I, I think Margot Kidder, it's got to be her best performance as this chain smoking, swearing, angry chick. But there's something nihilistic about it. I mean, the killer, I mean, spoiler alert, the killer is not arrested at the end of the movie. Where, I mean, Carpenter does that ending where the killer gets away, but there's something jaunty and lovable about Halloween, whereas Black Christmas is just endlessly dark. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Carpenter, uh, I, I think is Halloween's best described as like a county fair haunted house movie. You know what I mean? You go in, you have a great time, you're scared, but it's still fun. Black Christmas, I think, crosses the line from fun to just depressing. There's some really ugly murders in it, and I love the movie for that, and if you're in the mood for an artistic horror, that's like hereditary in the 70s. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's just dark, and I love, I love dark, but I also like jaunty. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't want you to feel bad when you leave, you know? Yeah. Uh, another one that was on the list that I don't think a lot of people are familiar with, and I just stumbled across it when it came out back in the early 2000s, is Session 9. And it was actually filmed, uh, I live in the Nashville area, and it's actually filmed up in Louisville, Kentucky. At oh, you didn't even hear me in the asylum, huh? The yeah. hospital. Yeah, the Session 9. Um, it, it's a huge, Waverly Hills, where they filmed it, is a huge uh, paranormal hotspot now for uh, for ghost hunters to go and investigate and stuff. But that film was wonderful, and it 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 kind of uh, made me aware of Waverly Hills Sanatorium up there. Well, I, to me, when you, when you go to a set or a location that, that has, a, as you said, a supernatural hotspot, I did, I, I, I did a bank commercial where I played a bank guard in a bank commercial, and we shot it on Halloween. And we shot it at Linda Vista, the haunted hospital, which is, they, they turned into low income housing, which is terrible to do to people because, Linda Vista is one of the scariest buildings I've ever been in. You know, I don't know if you you show you, know, you with the paranormal in your title. Yeah, it's an old Santa Fe Railroad Hospital, Linda Vista, and and it's just the creepiest place you've ever been in. During because it was Halloween and everyone was in the mood for horror. Uh, one of the one of the PAs she mistakenly believed they shot the ending of Elm Street, one of the Elm Streets, in the basement of Linda Vista. I don't think they did. She and I were wandering around the basement with the PA. And the basement was all red brick and it was partially flooded. And you would find a trolley of blood samples from the late 60s with the person's names on it and everything else. Wow. All the medical files were there. It was so creepy. There's water dripping down from the ceiling and it's into these filing cabinets and these metal filing cabinets and wooden filing cabinets I walked, and you see all these pumped-up files inside it, balling up from, you know, just rotting. I mean, just rotting here in the basement. Yeah, that's just creepy to see all that. I think it's creepy to see all that uh, just medical equipment that's kind of in ruins where it's just been sitting there, or like you're saying, the blood vials and, like, the old patient files just kind of abandoned there. I think it makes the setting a little creepy. With the names and the birth dates of all the patients on there, and the, and the, and the day... I mean, the, the, I think the latest the latest blood samples were from like 1977. Wow, yeah, I bet that just sitting there, sitting to look at. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's a place that um, I know some of the paranormal TV shows have gone and investigated. Well, I've been I've done a couple of commercials there, and I was there when a friend was shooting the horror movie Orbs. And any time you were in a hallway by yourself, you would literally feel the hair on your neck go up. I can't explain it. And with two girls in that basement, I was scared effless. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> right. I thought if something weird and freaky comes out of here, I thought I can't tell the girls, but I'm going to be the first one on that elevator. <laughs> <laughs> another another movie on the list um, that I've seen that I'm surprised not more people have seen is like Pumpkinhead. It is a great movie. Well, the weird thing about Pumpkinhead is Pumpkinhead was released a year in California. They released it a year before it officially came out. It showed up in the late 80s as Vengeance of the Demon. They took, it wasn't a big release. Two movies came out that year that the studios pulled back, redubbed, re-released. 
One was my old artist about a cat and a puppy, a puppy and a kitten, and the other was Pumpkinhead. They had two different titles, and they, they both showed up a year later. I'm friends with Jeff East, who plays the, the male lead. He was also young car Kent, you know, not in Atlanta. He's in with Lance Henriksen. And he told me, Pumpkinhead, I mean, he's in one of the Superman movies. He did, uh, he played Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. He played Huck Finn. But even he told me his own children's favorite movie of his was Pumpkinhead. You know, and, and, they, and even though it's set by you in the deep, the deep mystical south, it was actually filmed in the valley out here. Wow, there's a bunch of movies uh, like that that they, um, like the original Halloween. Um, oh, they filmed it out there. But I they... was at Deborah Hall's uh, memorial service. Yeah, you know, uh, my brother had worked with her on a couple projects and, and asked me to, to, you know, pay our specs because he was out of town. And they shot Halloween here, like you said, even though it's in Illinois. At a memorial service, all these friends of ours from the Halloween movies and everything else and Fisher King, they were all laughing, telling the story about, even though she produced the movie, even though she wrote the movie, the first thing she would do on the California locations when they shot a rap, she would grab a rake and start raking all the leaves and brought with them back into the garbage bags. <laughs> Every time you see somebody's yard in Halloween when they're trick-or-treating or going to different houses, it was the same bag of uh, the same three bags of garbage bags of leaves that they would uh, that they would do, do, rake into a bag and take with them. Uh, Tommy Lee Wallace, who directed Halloween Three: Season the Witch, and he was the, he was uh, editor and sound editor and and, uh, and production designer on you know, this, on different John Carpenter movies. He built the uh, he told me he built the closet. He built the closet for Halloween that Michael Myers was going to break into. Yeah. He played, he told, I, I interviewed him and uh, Nick Castle on stage for one of the Halloween anniversaries in Pasadena. And he told me this great story that he told Nick Castle, he goes, if you break this closet and not hit it, and not hit it where I need you to hit it, I'm going to kill you because I was up for two nights building this closet. <laughs> and that's when he goes, you know what, why don't you be the shape in the scene so you know exactly where to hit it. So that's how he became the the closet shape, you know, breaking in on her in the you know in the closet. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, the, you got a, you got one shot at this, and you better get it right. <laughs> exactly, and he said, "I did not spend forty eight hours working in the closet for you to hit in the wrong spot." <laughs> and it was a genius idea because he knew exactly. He became the shape for that scene because he knew exactly where to attack the closet and exactly where it would f everything up. In fact, you know, another great story Tommy told me. Tommy said when they were editing Dark Star or something, he liked how the scissors would make this peep, peep, the editing the sound editing scissors would make this peep, peep, sign, sound. So he used that for the gang silencers in the Salt and Prison Thirteen, the original. Yeah, that's interesting. I heard an interesting story about off the topic of horror movies, but Star Wars, how they got like the uh sounds for the lightsabers and, and for the uh the laser guns that they use. For some of the sounds where they hit like a taut wire and it made like that okay. sound. Okay, I can tell you this because if you look it up, if you look it up, I did that story. I interviewed Ben Burke, the Oscar-winning sound man for the Sounds of Star Wars. It's a two-parter in Star Wars Insider cover story, and he said in Marin County there was a field where the giant. He would go around and do ambient sounds for different. He wouldn't know why he would record the sounds, but he would think, eventually I'm going to need the sound. I don't know why. And interviewing him on the sounds of Star Wars, he said uh, uh, Chewbacca is bears at the zoo, and it's a walrus at feeding time. Some of Chewbacca's sounds are a walrus at feeding time at the old Greenland. And he had this great story. When the lightsabers clashed, he said it was a uh, it was an old TV on a UHF channel of static. It was a 16 millimeter projector, you know, with a hum. They blended them all together, and when they would hit, he took his wedding ring off and he would bang it against the guy wire of a, of a telephone pole in the middle of nowhere, you know, and the the, the transformer sound, you know what I mean, and. Yeah. and uh, he would literally go out. He said when, when the pickles came up, one of his better stories, he drove his car. He, he put in his notes where he got the sound of everything. He, for episode one, he had to have a lightsaber battle between, uh, um, 
you know, uh, uh, Qui Gon Jinn goes up against the uh, the Darth Maul. Darth Maul, yeah. So he drove and drove and drove and worked and worked and worked, trying to find the old the high tension wire where he was banging the wedding ring for the original Star Wars. And he found it, and he said condos were now completely around it. And he said it was murder getting the the sound of just the, the just the, the wire going pish with your the clashing sabers. But he did. And he also, a year after Star Wars, he did the amazing... Here's another one. Here's another one. You were asking what's the best in, in the 50 greatest horror films. Here's another movie on that list, and, and this should be one of your highest ones. The remake, the 1978 remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah. And he used a bunch of sounds for when the, when the pod people point and they do the scream. And he said one of the sounds they make is slaughterhouse pigs. You know, pigs... That terrified scream of slaughterhouse pigs, which he taped and used that in the film, you know, for the, the shriek of the, uh, the pod people. And the other thing he did that was really interesting is he said, if you watch the movie, you know, in the, the first hour or the first 40 minutes, you'll hear birds, you'll hear, you'll hear people, you'll hear the hum, you know, just hear people moving about, sound, laughter, everything in the background. And then he says, as the movie goes on, the pods are taking over. It's nothing but mechanical sounds and garbage trucks because the uh, humanity and birds and everything are now gone. He says he was really proud of that because he said as the movie goes on, you don't consciously notice, but you're no longer hearing wildlife, you're no longer hearing the laughter of people. You know? Yeah. I I had to ask him my favorite sound effect. I mean, you're talking to Ben Burt, you know, and you you have to know what his favorite. You if you have a favorite sound effect from a. A Luca Lucas movie he did, you have to ask. And that Lucas Spielberg movie. And I always wanted to know where the clink came from at the very, 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 very end of Raiders of Lost Ark. When the, when the top of the Ark of Covenant closes, you just hear this simple clink. Yeah. After all this bombast and all the, you know, the roaring of it when it's open, you just hear this little clink and it's all, it's all over. And he laughed and laughed and he said, that's the toilet to his house. That was him putting the, uh, the, the, the toilet, the, the back cover of the toilet on top of the toilet. And he said when the toilet broke down and he had to get it replaced, he, he kept the toilet top in case Spielberg ever needed the Ark of Covenant again. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, that's another dedication. another great sound effect of his. Again, this is all in my Star Wars Insider two-parter, Sounds of Star Wars from several years ago. But the other great sound is when Indy is running from the boulder, yeah, that, that's in, in 1980, 1981, Honda, in neutral, growing over a gravel road on, on the Lucasfilm Ranch, on, on gravel on, 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 the, on the marine campus of Lucasfilm. And he just slowed it down. He took the, the, the sound of the Honda crunching gravel, and by slowing it down, made it sound like a giant ponderous boulder rolling out of control. Wow, it's crazy where some of those sounds come from. Like the Foley artists, they've always amazed me. <clears throat> and the sound designers, just amazing where they get some of these sounds from and how they can create. And it and it fools you into into thinking, you know, when you're watching the movie, you don't think that all those different sounds are have to come from a sound stage or, you know, from something like that, recording it out in the, you know, general world, just different noises. But uh, they have to add all that stuff in. Yeah, it just feels like it's happening. In a good movie, it feels like it's happening as you watch it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Even somebody like simple as walking across gravel, they have to add stuff like that in. And just because it's easier than trying to get all those little sounds onto audio while they're filming. On a set, they'll usually do like a choir for ambient sound or something if they're trying to think of a cricket or something. But yeah, usually usually all that is done months and months afterwards. You know, yeah, they go for town where they'll... they'll They'll just, they'll do the tone where they, they, nothing. They just want to pick up the sound, you know? One of the other movies on that list that, um, that I'm surprised more people haven't, haven't seen is, uh, When a Stranger Calls because it, it came out in 1979, but it has influenced so many movies, even movies now, um, that kind of premise that the killer is in the house calling. Um, even like yeah. all the screen it, movies. It was an old urban legend they picked up, and I think they're lucky. And by the way, Fred Walton, who did When a Stranger Calls, he did a When a Stranger Calls back for a cable. And if you get a chance to see that one, that one's pretty great, too. Have you ever seen that with Cal Kane? I have not seen the, the, the second one, no. When a Stranger Calls back, he did for cable. And they, they did a cheapo, 
signal for cable because, the, you know, I, I guess in the early days of cable, when a stranger calls was one of those low budget slashers, they ran and ran and ran and ran. And they turned around and, uh, and, and they turned around and, and basically, uh, uh, eventually made the sequel. Kel Kane, I guess they'll probably get Kel Kane and everybody. And it's a good sequel. It's the original director and they come up with a really freaky last 10 minutes, which is why that one's sort of famous. But like you said, Charles Durning acting his ass off. I mean, the trailer was their urban legend. You know, have you checked the children and the calls are coming from inside the house? Yeah. You know, I, I get Stephen King raves about it in Dance Macabre because you see how effed up the killer is. He's kind of a messed up Richard Speck type guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's much, it's much better than the remake. You know, uh, the remake is pretty terrible. I tried watching the remake, but yeah, it's it's just not as good. It's not as creepy and. I, I think they do a better job in it with like in the screen movies of using that same premise. Yeah, I, in in uh, the when a stranger calls, I think Camilla Bell is beautiful, and you know she did the best she can with what they gave her. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. But it was one of those movies. If the cat jumps on the table for a cheap scare, it sounds like he's wearing snow shoes. You know right. what I mean? Right. I'm, 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 you know, the cat doesn't make that sound jumping on a table. Right. And that's it for part one for today. Be on the lookout for part two coming soon. Y'all stay safe out there. Thanks for listening to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Join us next time for a new episode of the Unseen Paranormal. Until then, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at our website, unseenparanormalpodcast.com. And don't forget to like, review, rate, and share with all your friends. Thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. Listen to our theme song and more of his music at chrislipsmusic.com. And remember, some of the scariest things are unseen. <laughs>